engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. It is 8 after the hour. I am Eric Erickson. This is Atlanta's Evening News. Except we're on at 3 o'clock. Welcome. The phone number 404-872-0750. Y'all, I have got to play you some audio real quick. Uh, This is Wes Cantrell, state representative on the floor of the Georgia House yesterday. This is a hallelujah, amen moment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, uh, like many of you, I'm grateful to be a native of the great state of Georgia. Can I get a witness? All right. And I am proud that our state is a welcoming state and that we are known for our southern hospitality. And this weekend, we got a lot of visitors coming in, and I'm glad that we are so welcoming to our visitors from all over. They're here for a football game. But I have to tell you, as I've driven around the city this week, I've seen some disturbing signs. Now, you know when the doorbell rings at your house, some visitors are more welcome than others. He's putting Coca-Cola on the podium. How many of you have had that terrible experience of going to the restaurant and ordering a Coke? Only to be told, is, you know, the Coke wannabe, is blank okay? Now, I got two responses to that question. The one, one is, heck no, it's not okay. But then the second one is, yeah, it's okay, but I wasn't looking for an okay experience. I was looking to have the original, the real thing. Are you with me? Friends don't let friends drink a Coke wannabe. Am I right? Especially in Georgia. Coke's been here since 1868. It's the number one soda on the planet. Soda, come on. Always will be. (laughs) So to our friends in the blue can, thank you for coming and spending your money in our great city. We're grateful for that. But we also want to say, bless your heart. (laughs) (laughs) That was State Representative Wes Cantrell. Uh, It was actually day before yesterday. You know, if you go downtown in Atlanta, there are lots and lots of Pepsi billboards uh, for the football game. And they are the official soft drink sponsor for the Super Bowl. And they're doing it here in Atlanta, uh, the headquarters of Coca-Cola. So we should all thank Wes Cantrell, state representative uh, from up in Cherokee County, for being bold enough to take to the well of the Georgia House and come in Coca-Cola uh, against its competitor. Do you know, by the way, now it, it's been a while, but it used to be that the only country on the planet where Pepsi outsells Coca-Cola, where they, they both sell, the only one is Burma. And it's because back in the days of all the, the awfulness in Burma, Coke refused to market itself there to the war criminals who were in charge of the regime. And Pepsi, I'm told, uh, was willing to do advertising in a country of despots like that. And so it got ahead of Coke. But everywhere else on the planet, uh, the free market shows Coca-Cola is the far superior product uh, to Pepsi. Typically, you can tell a Yankee because they drink Pepsi over Coke by preference as opposed to availability. But I'm just in any of it. He should be commended. Now, we need to move on. I'm going to I'm not going to needle the uh, state representative for saying soda. Um, At least he didn't say pop, but nonetheless, it looks like the Equal Rights Amendment issue here in Georgia may be at an end. I've had several uh, leaders in the state Senate tell me that uh, they expect it to go nowhere, to calm down. Uh, they're very upset with me and y'all for being riled up about this. I, I got to tell you, they should not be upset with either me or you uh, for deciding to rush into an amendment to the United States Constitution, not knowing what it did. I, I found some great quotes by Ruth Bader Ginsburg who was one of the advocates for the Equal Rights Amendment back during the 1970s. Let me read you some quotes. These are from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You can find her law review articles. There were several of them from the 1978, 1979, different law review journals. Uh, This is a quote. The Equal Rights Amendment arms the judiciary. Without the Equal Rights Amendment, 
positions and programs feminist support can be ignored safely or at least deferred, such as child care programs and delivery of health services. She went on to say that if the Equal Rights Amendment passed, states would no longer be allowed to prioritize adoption over abortion. Think about that for a minute. There is you a real feminist who thinks that abortion should be on the same level playing field as adoption and that it should be unconstitutional for a state to elevate adoption over abortion. Now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I need to set the stage for you. Bear with me. We spent a lot of time yesterday on the radio about this, and I realize we're we're on at three right now because we got, we got Super Bowl traffic coming. We needed to shake up the clock. Um, in fact, we're leaving. All of our non-essential personnel at our office are now fleeing the building to get home. The Georgia State Senate Republicans have decided they want to take up the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. That is, uh, it would be the 29th Amendment to the Constitution. When Congress pushed it out in the early 1970s, 1972, I believe, they said it needed to be con- uh, affirmed within 10 years. The hang-up is that the, it's, the Constitution is not clear on whether Congress can set a time limit. The 28th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified in 1992. The 28th Amendment had actually been issued as part of the package of the Bill of Rights in 1789, and it circulated for more than 200 years before the 38th state, Michigan, voted for it, putting it into the Constitution. And so there's a question of whether or not Congress has the power under its enacting enabling resolutions to even restrict the time for passage. And if Georgia were to pass the Equal Rights Amendment and there were, were no time restriction, the Equal Rights Amendment would be law. Now, I, I have gotten emails from listeners, and I have a hard time believing that there are this many willfully naive people out there, but apparently... Half uh, just over a majority of our state Senate is included in the willfully naive category. The Equal Rights Amendment, let me actually just do yourself a public service here, and I'm going to read you the actual text of the Equal Rights Amendment that Georgia would be voting on. Uh, it says, Equal equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Now, ask yourself, what right under the law is being denied or abridged based on sex? What right do men have that women don't have in this country? What 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 right do they have? You can say that, well, men get paid more than women. Actually, if you look at the data... Uh, Women and men who work the same job tend to get paid equally. It is that women make different lifestyle choices, including staying home with kids and whatnot. That puts them out of the workforce. That puts them behind. That's why there is a pay gap. It it has nothing to do with discrimination. What, What right do men have that women don't have? Or what right do women have that men don't have? Well... I, there, that's the willful naivete that has led the state Senate in Georgia to pursue ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. Over to you, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's written extensively about what the Equal Rights Amendment would mean. According to the Equal Rights Amendment's passage, according to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, if the ERA passes, it means states would no longer be able to prioritize adoption over abortion. It means states would have to pay for taxpayer-funded abortion in the same way under Medicare and Medicaid, states have to pay for a prostate surgery for men. It means that states could no longer put off dealing with, according to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, direct quote from her, it's a footnote in her law review article, child care programs and the delivery of health services. It's Ruth Bader Ginsburg a justice on the United States Supreme Court. You can look at the language, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex and say, well, that's kind of innocuous. We're already there. But you put it in the Constitution and guess what happens? Progressives have a play day uh, of going out there and trying to find new things. They can say, oh, this this is part of it. You pay for a man surgery. Well, it's like, look at the Georgia legislature right now. There is a move to get rid of the sales tax on tampons under the idea that, well, you know, this is something that women have to have. It's a medical condition. We shouldn't be paying sales tax. And, you know, there's a fair argument on that one. But 
you put this in the Constitution, they're going to say, well, only women can get pregnant, and so we need to pay for their abortions. In fact, every single state that has a state version of the ERA, their Supreme Courts have all ruled that, yes, as a matter of fact, the Equal Rights Amendment requires states pay for abortion. You know those states that tried to stop paying for abortions under Medicaid in the last year, and they've all been stopped by federal courts? Do you know why the federal courts have stopped them? Because the states that are trying to do this have equal rights amendments. And the federal courts have said, you can't do this under your state constitutions. You have an equal rights amendment that requires that you pay for abortion. So you've already got federal courts saying equal rights amendments at the state level require the taxpayer-funded abortion. You put it in the federal constitution, guess what's going to happen? So listen, I, I appreciate the willful naivete of people who say, all it says is that you got to have equal rights. It's not a taxpayer-funded abortion bill. You can say that all you want, but you know, there's the words abortion don't appear in the U.S. Constitution. There's not even a privacy clause under the U.S. Constitution. But the Supreme Court has interpreted one of the amendments to the Constitution to mean there's a privacy right, and then subsequently interpreted that privacy right from Griswold versus Connecticut into Roe versus Wade, a right to an abortion. You put this in the Constitution, you can say all you want. Oh, it doesn't do that. It just says the equal rights under the law. You're giving progressives a field day to be able to say, no, wait a second. What equal rights means is you got to do all these things. And every single major law review article from advocates of equal rights, from representatives of the ACLU to Ruth Bader Ginsburg to NARAL to Planned Parenthood, it all comes back to abortion that the Equal Rights Amendment would require taxpayer-funded abortion. And so your state Senate, the state Senate in Georgia, the state Senate Republicans are considering the Equal Rights Amendment. And that's what it would amount to. And the majority of them don't know. Now, there's a witch hunt going on in the state Senate because eight of them have leaked to me what happened in the caucus meeting where members were standing up and saying that the, this was all about the optics. They, they, they need to get the suburbs back. Doing something like this is innocuous. Equal rights are the law. Who doesn't oppose that? We can say we support it. We can win back the women. We should do this. And none of them had a clue what they were talking about. Some of them admitting that this would happen before they were born. They don't know. It sounds good. Let's do it. Without understanding the implications. We actually have people we've elected to office who want to amend the United States Constitution and don't even understand what the amendment would do in our state legislature. So they can be mad at me all they want, but who else is going to hold them accountable? Who's going to let you guys know what they're doing? If you've got almost a dozen members of the state Senate willing to tell me what happened, begging me to raise the red flag and tell people what's going on, maybe they should consider that there's a problem there. Now, we got to step out for a quick timeout. When we come back, more on this and your phone calls. The phone number is 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. Always glad to take your phone calls. Just try not to be a crazy person. Now, let's see. I want to go to, let's see. Yes, I've got time. I want to go to Jeff calling from Atlanta. Jeff, you're going to be the first caller today. Welcome to WSB. Hey, Eric. Thanks for taking my call. I've been in Virginia for the last uh, week or so. Uh, Drove all the way down to Alabama listening to your podcast, podcast. But I want to point out that this ERA was also put into the General Assembly in Virginia, and yes. they did vote it down, but clearly this is a multi-state effort to get this passed. Yeah, it is. And one of the reasons it is, and, and I hope our state senators are listening, he, Antonin Scalia was asked about this in the 1990s, and Antonin Scalia said that he's an originalist, and you got to look at the original intent of the Constitution and the amendments there, too. And the original intent of the ERA was to secure Roe versus Wade as a constitutional right, knowing that its original underpinnings were nebulous, that you put in the Equal Rights Amendment, you would be putting in uh, an abortion amendment to the Constitution. That's Antonin Scalia. That's not me. That's Antonin Scalia. Does our state Senate know better than Antonin Scalia? I think not. (laughs) 
just a quick time out for a sponsor who I am a longtime user of, and that would be Quip. Uh, my electric toothbrush for two years now, more than two years actually, has been Quip. In fact, I just got my new brush head the other day. It's sitting right here. I've got it in my hand. It comes in a nice little tube. You can pop it open, and there's your toothbrush head. It's fantastic. I like Quip. What I like about Quip is that I've used other electric toothbrushes in the past, and the brush heads are so big, it's hard to get to the back of your mouth, and that's where I have a problem brushing after wisdom tooth surgery a number of years ago. I have a real hard time getting back there with uh, a lot of electric toothbrushes, and the Quip fits perfectly. Not only that, but it you don't have to worry about carrying a charger with you. It's got a AAA battery, and every three months, for five bucks, you get a new brush head. It also comes with a AAA battery, and so they keep you in stock. I really like it. I've used this for a number of years now. My wife uses it as well. Even my dentist has commented that I don't have a lot of tartar plaque buildup on my teeth these days, and it's because of the Quip. It really is. Uh, it vibrates for two minutes, and every 30 seconds pulses, so you know to reposition in your mouth, so you get a very even clean. You get the two minutes that dentists recommend. I really like this. It starts at $25 if you go to getquip.com slash Eric right now. You'll get your first brush head refill pack for free as well. That's your first refill pack for free at get. Q-U-I-P dot com slash Eric. It is 38 after the hour. Glad to have you back with me. Shaney B. Yes, I know. Uh, speaking of Shaney B. Oh, my good gracious googly moogly people. Shaney B. Went down to the stadium to see what was going on, and do you know who was down there protesting? You're, you're never. No, it wasn't even the West Bourbon. Nope, 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 what? Nope. The anti-circumcision people. Yes, that's right. They were calling it um, male genital mutilation. The anti, they're basically, they're, they're anti-Jew uh, among other things, uh, they they are opposed to circumcision, and they're down there at the stadium protesting. <laughs> yes, of all the things, uh, Shane had pictures up. They were wearing even white pants that had like red blood splatter there. Yes, yes, people with not enough time on their hands. My goodness gracious, you, you know who has a lot of time on their hands? Um. The left-wing Christians out there, I, I listen, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we need to dwell a little more on the infanticide stuff. The Virginia governor, of course, is, is coming out, as is Kathy Tran, the um, state representative in the state delegate in Virginia, who is trying to get infanticide made the law. And, and they're like, no, we, we never said that. People are quoting them. And I mean, it's very, you know... The media spends a lot of time on Donald Trump saying, oh, he lies. The president is saying this, and yesterday he said that, and now he's saying he never said it. Here's the video. He's lying. He's gaslighting us. It's what the Democrats in Virginia are doing, and the press is giving them a total buy. Uh, do you remember Kermit Gosnell? Kermit Gosnell was uh, an abortionist in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who, when investigators went in after multiple reports that a woman finally died, went in and found that he was flushing children down the toilet, literally flushing living, breathing children down toilets, among other things. He, he's in jail, I believe, for the rest of his life. He's horrific crimes. Uh, told one woman to deliver into the toilet. Um, and the Washington Post called that a local crime story and didn't cover it. It was Kirsten Powers the liberal commentator used to be at Fox, now at CNN, who wrote about it in a USA Today column and shamed the Washington Post into covering it. And even then, they took the conservatives pounce argument. They're, they're doing that now with this in Virginia, the conservatives pounce argument. What I find interesting are the goats. I, I don't mean the greatest of all time people, the uh, goats. By, to be forever to figure out, when people were talking about goat, they were calling people goat. I was like, this is offensive. And then realized, greatest of all time, goat. Okay, I got that. Well, I'm not talking about those. Uh, there's that scripture in Matthew of, um, hey, hang on, I'm going to pause here for a moment because I need a relevant aside. I got a note last night from someone who was very upset. Uh, they had called into the program and they did not get on air with me. And they wanted to essentially 
go off on a, a religious tangent and turn the show into a seminary class. I spend a lot of time on this program talking Jesus, and it gets some people really upset. And I'm okay talking Jesus, but when I do it, I do it. Um, it is my show and I try to direct the flow of the show and I don't want to go off in a theological seminary class. Uh, and I am a, a billion percent appreciative for being surrounded with great people, including my call screener who understand these things and prevent these calls from getting on air to go off on these tangents. Uh, if, if I want to allow you to come on and talk shop with me, seminary theology, whatnot, I, I'll tell you. But I'm not just going to divert my show in that area. And I have said the other day, I, I, there are times that I think I can make a political socioeconomic point without having to get off into theology. And I think for the bulk of the audience, uh, that's where I should go. There are times where you do have to make the 50,000 foot view looking down theological argument. And I'm totally comfortable doing that. It's one reason I went back to seminary is to be able to talk about that even more. But I'm not going to hijack my show every day. This isn't a religious broadcasting uh, show. So don't get upset with me and don't get upset with my call screener. I'll, I'll tell you when I'm ready to go there. And I'm ready to go there right now. For the duration of the Trump administration, we have had um, left-wing Christians, and I'm using Christians in air quotes because I don't really believe they are, uh, and they've demanded that Orthodox Bible-believing Christians rush out and take a stand against Donald Trump on the Muslim ban, on refugees, on the border crisis, on separating parents from children, on the president's behavior, on the president's remarks, on and on and on and on. You, you get these people who rush out of the gate and say, you say you're a Christian, how can you support this? You must get on record. You must oppose the president. And by and large, a lot of the prominent Orthodox Christians out there, myself, Russell Moore, others, will get out there and say, you know what? We, we disagree with the president on this. The Bible says you got to take care of widows and orphans. And even among us on the Orthodox Christian side, we don't always agree on border security at the border and stuff. I do think it's a terrible thing to separate children from parents. I understand why they do it. Uh, if, if they don't have to, I don't think they should. But we get out there and we're willing to say, in fact, there are more people on the right willing to stand up and say, hey, we think this is wrong on our side than there are on the left. And this infanticide stuff is a great example. All of those same uh, left wing people who claim to be Christian, who rush out and demand that Bible believing Christians take a stand against the president are remarkably silent, remarkably silent about the infanticide measures. In fact, the best they've got out there right now is Rachel Held Evans, who used to be a Christian and has become an Episcopalian, and she runs out and passively, aggressively retweets a bunch of people defending the laws. But even she won't come out of her own words and say she's okay with it. She's just retweeting other people who are distorting what's going on. I mean, there's that passage in the Bible about um, on the final day that uh, the Lord will separate the sheep from the goats. And the goats will go off into eternal punishment. He's not going to need a lot more help to separate them because they're separating themselves. You got Tony Campolo. He's the founder of Red Letter Christians. Yet there's actually, is this not the most pretentious group ever? Red Letter Christians. They only pay attention to the red letters in the Bible because those are the ones Jesus said. You know what? I got news for you. John three sixteen. the odds are Jesus didn't actually say that. That's all editorializing. Yeah, I know. Blow your mind. Just consider the context, but they only want to pay attention to the red letters, the things they think Jesus actually said. One of the things Jesus actually said was to pay attention to what the apostles say because they speak for him, and they totally ignore those guys because they're not red letters. Well, Tony Campolo, his website, Red Letter Christians, they've spent a lot of time defending Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. They've been a, spent a lot of time lamenting the rise of climate change. They spent a lot of time defending national or democratic socialism. But they haven't said a word about New York and Virginia. Tony Campolo himself hasn't said a word. Then, of course, there's my favorite left-wing Christian poser, Jim Wallace of Sojourners. Hasn't said a word about it. One of the funny things is there's a guy named Shane Claiborne. He works with Tony Campolo at Red Letter Christians. And he's been on Twitter lamenting gun violence in America. He lamented. He, he actually spent m several tweets on social media mourning the execution of a cop killer. But has not spent even 100 characters mourning the embrace of infanticide by Democrats. Nope, nope. Completely silent on that issue. 
And then, uh, again, there's the, the Christian turned Episcopalian, Rachel Held Evans, who she's retweeted a bunch of stuff denying that this was actually going on. She's basically helping to gaslight America. Say, oh, you didn't actually hear what you heard. Where are these people sitting up? Th- this is the remarkable thing here. There are far more people on the right willing to criticize positions of the Republican Party than there are people on the left willing to criticize Democrats. There are far more conservatives out there willing to say this is bad from conservatives than there are progressives out there willing to say something progressives are doing is bad. You know, I have spent a lot of energy here on this show saying I wish the president did something differently. I think he did something wrong. He shouldn't have done something When's the last time you heard a prominent progressive go out and say, you know what, Antifa shouldn't be doing what they're doing. They're they're on my side and they're bad. Nope. Nope. You, you don't hear that at all. You, you don't hear it. The intellectual diversity on the left is zero. And all of these people who claim to be Christians on the left, what are they doing? They all claim to be pro-life and they're completely silent on New York and Virginia saying that while a woman is in labor, she can have an abortion if she wants. And they're peddling these studies that show, and, and I, I, some of you, because I've interacted with some of you on email, I know, some of you have seen a study that showed that the majority of women out there who have very late-term abortions, it's for change in life, circumstances, whatnot, and you say, oh, this, this study, it didn't contemplate uh, fetal defects, so how can you say that? There are actually other studies out there from the Guttmacher Institute, which is Guttmacher Institute, which is Planned Parenthood's research wing. You can go see them. They're highly respected. Even if I don't like the people, they're highly respected. And there are actually studies going back to the 1980s that show that uh, the number of people who have late-term abortions based on fetal defect or life of the mother is actually far less than the people who their life circumstance changed. Their husband walked out on them. They lost their job, something like that. Those are the people who tend to have... Uh, late-term abortions, because by and large, any mother who has had a child and gone through the process of the different tests you have to have, the ultrasounds you have to have, all of that, knows that you're not super far along before you know whether there are fetal defects. By the way, you know the the, uh, District of Columbia says a fetal defect that can cause an abortion is if the mother, late in the pregnancy, used substances that could impair the fetus. So go have a glass of bourbon and then cart yourself off to the abortion clinic and they're okay with that. Get the process going. This is inhumane. And where are these so-called red-letter Christians who stand up every time the president does something and demand that you and I take a stand? Where are they? They've gone into hiding. They're going to answer one day. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't help you? And then he's going to answer to them, most certainly I tell you, because you didn't do it to one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me. These will then go away into eternal punishment. Yes, they will. It is 57 after the hour. The phone number is 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. We've got about a minute and a half here. And we need to talk about Stacey Abrams. She's not going away. This is something that the Republicans in our state legislature need to pay attention to. Instead of doing these stupid messaging uh, bills where they're going to ratify uh, taxpayer-funded abortion into the U.S. Constitution. Maybe they need to pay attention to what the Democrats are actually doing here. It, it doesn't matter what the GOP does to try to be liked. The Democrats are going to try to turn it on their head and run a permanent campaign. So what the GOP needs to do is get ahead of the game and start doing their own messaging. Get the Democrats on record. Do they support infanticide? Do they support late-term abortion? Uh, Get the Democrats on record of do they support 70% tax rates. Get the Democrats on record of do they want to get rid of school choice or expand school choice. You know, in Florida, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, just issued an executive order getting rid of Common Core in the state. Now, I I don't think that our governor unilaterally can do it by executive order under Georgia law, uh, but it's something that Republican state legislature should consider. My goodness, y'all. So we moved our kids to a new school for a number of reasons, a couple of big ones. 
Uh, no need to get into that. But we can now actually help our kids with math again because they've gone back to real math, the math that you and I grew up with. They're not doing the common core garbage uh, that made it impossible for parents to help their kids with homework. It's phenomenal, and they're doing well at it. They're enjoying it. It's making sense. They're not trying to learn to subtract by adding, which is what Common Core makes you do. It's brilliant. When we come back, Stacey Abrams and the NeverEnding Campaign. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson. This is Atlanta's Evening News on WSB. And believe it or not, it's the second hour, not the first hour. We started at three today because Super Bowl traffic. Yes, my friends, the traffic outside is frightful. Um, It's just it's people are leaving the offices early trying to get out of Dodge. I don't blame them. I am actually fleeing to California. Uh, Well, actually, I'm doing it during the Super Bowl. I didn't think things through. I got to go give a speech on Monday. I'll be here too, um, because the uh, the time change. I'll be able to do the show and then go to the speech. But yeah, I'm leaving. I think my flight is at five o'clock on Sunday. <laughs> I wasn't thinking this through. Uh, it's one of those things where I can't actually get out to where I'm going in California and back in a day. So it's very frustrating. But nonetheless, I digress. We got to move on. Stacey Abrams is in the news. Um, she's in the news. Because she's going hardcore uh, in a response to Francis Fukuyama and also giving the State of the Union address. It's just fascinating to see the Democrats being so willing and comfortable going into this direction. Now, you probably need to let me set this up for you a little bit just so you understand. Um, Francis Fukuyama is a widely respected uh, historian philosopher who's written a number of famous books and a number of famous essays, and one of them is a critique of identity politics that was published in Foreign Affairs magazine. And Stacey Abrams is now responding, essentially, to Fukuyama's uh, objections to the um, to Fukuyama's essay against identity politics. She writes, Americans must thoughtfully pursue an expanded identity conscious politics new vibrant noisy voices represent the strongest tool to manage the growing pains of multicultural coexistence by embracing identity and its prickly uncomfortable contours americans will become more likely to grow as one but see that's not really true and she gives away the game right there multicultural coexistence. The motto of the United States is e pluribus unum, from many, one. And this is reflected in the historic debate in the United States that really came about in the 1990s as things began to shift, where we used to talk about the melting pot. The United States is a melting pot. The taco has become as American as the hamburger. The hamburger is as American as the French fry. The French fry is as American as ice cream and apple pie. None of which originated in this country, uh, but all of which are central to the American identity. The burrito. The taco. uh, Chinese takeout. All are part of the American cultural fabric. Uh, They are based on ideas from abroad that were then made into something quintessentially American here. That was part of the melting pot. The cultures all melt together into a common, distinct thing. But in the 1990s, and particularly into the 2000s, uh, left-wing academics began to discuss that the salad bowl was better than the melting pot. And the way the salad bowl worked is what Stacey Abrams is getting at in this language. New, vibrant, noisy voices represent the strongest tool to manage the growing pains of multicultural coexistence. See, in the salad bowl, the lettuce leaf, the onion, the radish, the tomato, the cucumber, the crouton, the salad dressing, they don't become one thing. They are each separate and distinct. You can pull out the lettuce leaf, and you may certainly taste the salad dressing or the juice of the cucumber from which it was touched, but it is distinctly the leaf of lettuce. You can pull out the cucumber, and it is distinctly the cucumber, maybe with a hint of onion because there was an onion on top of it. 
You can pull out the crouton, and yeah, it's absorbed some of the flavors, but it's still probably crunchy. And they each remain distinct. And the downside of that is that you essentially have a non-homogenous uh, American culture. And the irony here is that progressives like Stacey Abrams, they want homogeneity in moral values or immoral values, depending on your way of looking at it. They want, for example, a uniform ex acceptance of gay marriage. They want uniform acceptance of transgenderism. They want uniform acceptance of abortion rights. They want uniform acceptance of uh, a host of progressive social values. But they do not want a homogenized American culture. See, where conservatism has come in is, is you have a, an American culture that is distinctly American and values that are regional. And the left wants values that are universal in the United States, but cultures that are distinct and protected. And you turn things upside down. And we can see where this is headed in Georgia politics, headed into 2020 and 2022 with David Perdue and Brian Kemp up for re-election of those dates. Essentially, the way Abrams does this, let me focus on this key sentence again. That, um, oh, where to go? Uh, Americans must thoughtfully pursue an expanded identity conscious politics new vibrant noisy voices represent the strongest tool to manage the growing pains now what are the growing pains of multicultural ecosystem well essentially it's to keep everyone inflamed all of the time it is the self-perpetuating crisis to never let it go to waste so what we're going to see, and, and this is why the Republicans in the state legislature need not go down the road of the Equal Rights Amendment, because they're not going to get credit for it. They're only going to get blame. The, the Republicans in the state Senate are operating on the idea that the Democrats in the state legislature are behaving as they were just four years ago, and they're not. They've had a change in strategy, and it is the never-ending crisis, the never-ending political agitation led by Stacey Abrams. I mean, consider this. Stacey Abrams is out attacking the Covenant Catholic kids. Uh, Stacey Abrams is out blasting them. She gave an interview about them after it was known, after it was known that the media got the story wrong, and she's doubling you know, down. There is a narrative that says that we don't have the full picture of what preceded that moment. But the issue is what happened in the moment we saw. And in that moment, we saw disrespect. We saw communities divided. And we heard language that is not appropriate. So no matter what instigated it, what we have to focus on is why this was the reaction. And unfortunately, this begins at the top. We have a commander in chief who has never failed to signal his xenophobia, his racism, his bigotry and his hatred. And that will absolutely filter down to the youngest and most impressionable members of our communities. And so we all have to stand up and say that regardless of why it began, it ends now. OK, so. Yeah, you can say, well, that sounds well and good, except she's blaming the president for the kids' behavior, and we now know that it wasn't the kids using that language. It was the black Hebrew cult, and she ignores them. We now know that the kids were being harassed by the drummer, who was also a serial liar, who also tried to disrupt mass at the Catholic Basilica in Washington, and she's focusing on those kids, and she's trying to say, oh, yeah, we're, we're told we don't know the end of the story, but those kids behave badly. He stood there. And had a, a, a stare down with the drummer who was trying to, they, they weren't actually the ones shouting now. She got the story wrong. Even after, even after it was known, it was well reported by then. And see what this is, is it's about stirring the pot, keeping people agitated, always keeping people agitated, always ensuring there are noisy voices. This is not going to end well for us. I, I'm reminded of Brian Kemp's inauguration. In Brian Kemp's inauguration, he said how easily elections divide us, but we're all Georgians. And he's not the governor of the people who voted for him. He's the governor of all Georgians. What the Democrats in Georgia are trying to do, led by Stacey Abrams now, and I, get, I suspect we're going to hear some of this in her State of the Union response, is divide people up into classes and races. Divide them, male and female. Look at the Democrats in Georgia trying to use the Equal Rights Amendment to, to stir up um, sex uh, claims against uh, men and women. 
look at uh, trying to stir up divisions among races, trying to stir up division among classes, the never ending campaign, keeping people mad at each other will be manage the growing pains of multicultural coexistence. That's what we're getting at. And Republicans need to find a way to counter this, not by succumbing to identity politics, but challenging people to rise above identity politics, not to view themselves as black, white, gay, straight, male, female, but view themselves as Americans and here view themselves as Georgians. The common values, not let the Democrats say, well, no, no, no. If you're a female white Georgian, this should be your value. No, there are common values and the Republicans in this state need to highlight, emphasize, and elevate those, including opposition to infanticide. And the Democrats don't want to go in that direction. Just a quick time out for a sponsor who I am a longtime user of, and that would be Quip. Uh, my electric toothbrush for two years now, more than two years actually, has been Quip. In fact, I just got my new brush head the other day. It's sitting right here. I've got it in my hand. It comes in a nice little tube. You can pop it open, and there's your toothbrush head. It's fantastic. I like Quip. What I like about Quip is that I've used other electric toothbrushes in the past, and the brush heads are so big, it's hard to get to the back of your mouth, and that's where I have a problem brushing after wisdom tooth surgery a number of years ago. I have a real hard time getting back there with uh, a lot of electric toothbrushes, and the Quip fits perfectly. Not only that, but it you don't have to worry about carrying a charger with you. It's got a AAA battery, and every three months, for five bucks, you get a new brush head. It also comes with a AAA battery, and so they keep you in stock. I really like it. I've used this for a number of years now. My wife uses it as well. Even my dentist has commented that I don't have a lot of tartar plaque buildup on my teeth these days, and it's because of the Quip. It really is. Uh, it vibrates for two minutes, and every 30 seconds, pulses so you know to reposition in your mouth so you get a very even clean you get the two minutes that dentists recommend i really like this it starts at 25 dollars if you go to getquip.com slash eric right now you'll get your first brush head refill pack for free as well that's your first refill pack for free at getquip.com slash eric Holy moly, great googly moogly. There is some huge breaking news. Uh, I just put it up at theresurgent.com. You can go there and see the picture. Well, you, you can go there and find the link to see the pictures. Gracious, someone has found a copy of Ralph Northam's uh, graduating class yearbook from the Eastern Virginia Medical School. Uh, let me just read you this from the Virginia Pilot newspaper. On the half page set aside for Northam, there's a headshot of him in a jacket and tie, a photo of him in a cowboy hat and boots, and a third of him sitting casually on the ground, leaning against a convertible. The fourth photo on the half page has two people, one wearing white Ku Klux Klan robes and a hood, the other in blackface. The person with the blackface is wearing a white hat, black jacket, white shirt, bow tie, and plaid pants. Both are holding canned drinks. Now, this is a, a half page set aside for Ralph Northam in his yearbook. And that's one of the pictures on that page for him. Yikes. We'll have more on that. As the story develops, he also is now saying he didn't say what he actually said. Oh, my goodness. Now, on the Ralph Northam story, you can go to the resurgent and find the link for this. Go to the resurgent.com. It is literally the top story right now. Um, what is fascinating about this is it is a half. Everybody has a half page in this yearbook and the picture of one person wearing a Ku Klux Klan outfit and another in blackface is on his. Uh, you can't tell who the people are, though. Obviously, one guy has a white hood over his face. The governor's office is not saying. Under the photo of the men in blackface and the Klan hood, uh, the are listed Northam's alma mater of the Virginia Military Institute and his interests, pediatrics. His quote is listed as, there are more old drunks than old doctors in the world, so I think I'll have another beer. Can you imagine if this was Brett Kavanaugh? Can you imagine? It's pretty clear that this is him, y'all. It's pretty clear that Ralph Northam is one of these two individuals in this picture. Why? Why else would they put that picture on his page in the yearbook? Is the media going to cover for Ralph Northam? Seems like there's another clear sense. The governor of Virginia has on his yearbook page, everyone in this yearbook had a half page dedicated to them. 
And this picture, I'm sure he'll say, oh, it's a mistake. It wasn't supposed to be on my page. Wow. Wow. This this is going to be a fascinating double standard to see. It really, really is. The phone number here, 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Uh, we will continue talking about this as we come back, but there is other news out there we need to talk about as well at the federal level, and that is President Trump getting ready for a State of the Union address on Tuesday, and he says he's going to call for Americans to essentially rise above the fray and unite together to solve the problems of this country. Um, He's also going to push strongly for debt and deficit reduction. We'll see if he's able to do that. And, of course, the media is already out blasting the president Uh, saying he's not going to really mean whatever he says. Really amazing. We'll get onto that when we come back. All righty, the phone number, 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. This story is blowing up. Uh, gracious, Ralph Northam, the governor of Virginia. is So every graduating student is the governor of Virginia. Uh, every single one of them had a half page in the school yearbook. And they had pictures related to them in those half pages on the yearbook. Ralph Northam's half page on his yearbook, Ralph Northam, the governor of Virginia, the man who has defended infanticide this week on his half page. I'm going to read you from the Virginia pilot that's breaking the story right now. On Ralph Northam's half page, there's a headshot of him in a jacket and tie, a photo of him in a cowboy hat and boots, and a third of him sitting casually on the ground, leaning against a convertible. The fourth picture on the half page of Ralph Northam's yearbook section has two people. One is wearing a white Ku Klux Klan robe and a hood. The other has his face painted black. The person with the black face is also wearing a white hat, black jacket, white shirt with a bow tie and plaid pants. Both are holding canned drinks. Now, if you click through at the resurgent.com where I've got this, it appears they're holding beers, although the picture is very old. But have you ever seen the the classic Budweiser cans from way back in the the 80s or whatnot? That, That appears to be what he's got in his hand. There, there's another picture of him also with uh, looks like a can of beer in his hand, and the quote under this picture. This is all about um, Ralph Northam, and the quote that is direct or the blurb that is directly under this picture of the man in blackface and the man in the KKK outfit are alma mater, Virginia Military Institute, interest pediatrics. Quote: There are more old drunks than old doctors in this world, so I think I'll have another beer. Up. Oh. Let's see who who else. It looks like the Washington Post now is pushing this story as well. Wow, this is exploding fast. Gracious. Um, it, it, maybe he should have not doubled down defending infanticide this week. Clearly, someone is now out to get Ralph Northam. And I got to tell you the truth. They wouldn't be pushing this. They wouldn't be pushing this if they didn't think that they could get the Democrat lieutenant governor elected governor or put in the governor's office. They wouldn't be pushing this if this was a Republican opposition piece. They wouldn't be pushing these stories. See, everybody right now is emotionally invested in propping up Ralph Northam. Everyone is emotionally invested in propping up Kathy Tran. Everyone is emotionally invested in defending 
late-term abortion and denying it has anything to do with infanticide, despite Ralph Northam and Kathy Tran's own words. They're not going to pile on this stuff. But gracious, the man's been elected for only a year. I'm already seeing somebody on social media. Northam's administration is a year old and no longer viable. (laughs) Guess it's time for a late-term abortion of the Northam. I mean, hey, it's already been delivered, but we can keep it comfortable while we decide what to do with it. I mean, those, those are his words. Those are Ralph Northam's words. That we, we can deliver the child and keep it comfortable, resuscitate it if need be, while the mother and doctor decide what to do. That That's what he said. We can do the same, I guess, with the Northam administration. <laughs> wow. This is just, wow. Uh, it, it, what's so striking here is that Ed Gillespie, who was the uh, Republican gubernatorial candidate in Virginia, did not have this. What happened to Republican opposition research during that campaign? There is a question. Okay, this really is just amazing that it's come out now. And my only thing that I can think of with the Northam yearbook picture coming out from the press now, not from an opposition candidate, but from the press, is that they have decided he has hurt himself and it's time for him to go. And this is a Democratic effort now to get him out. Tim Kaine, you know, Tim Kaine is the senator from Virginia. He was the Democrats' vice presidential nominee in 2016, for Pete's sakes. And Tim Kaine came out today and said the Virginia Democrats are wrong on this abortion legislation. Tim Kaine came out and said, I mean, this is Hillary Clinton's vice presidential nominee has come out and said, we don't need to change Virginia's law that we've had since the 1970s. They are out to get Northam. And I'm old enough to remember when Ralph Northam ran, the media said, oh, well, he's a moderate Democrat. He's actually too moderate for some. Some say he's a conservative. He's too moderate. Wow. The narratives the media is willing to push on candidates like Northam, who's nothing but a big old lib. I'm sorry, we call them progressive now because people realize they hated liberals. So they're going to soon be called liberals again because people will realize they hate progressives. Uh, Northam is on his way out. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how his office, his office, by the way, is not responding to anyone. Uh, Ralph Northam's office is completely quiet, is not answering phone calls, is not responding. Uh, wow. <laughs> so do any of you guys follow Bruce, uh, Gay Patriot on Twitter? Uh, his, his account is it's not necessarily family friendly. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy, a, a good friend. Uh <laughs> He's tweeting right now. Looks like Ralph Northam is the victim of a self-induced post-birth abortion. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. We will see whether or not Democrats rally to and try to protect Ralph Northam this afternoon. And I'm not holding my breath on them actually doing so because you do have to remember Northam is perceived by Democrats as being a rather moderate Democrat. Nor- Northam, Ralph Northam was, he was challenged by people further to the left than he was. He's a liberal. And he was challenged by others further left than he was. The Democrats don't particularly like him. They just viewed him as a caretaker because they didn't want the Virginia Democrats to go far left. And now this is coming out. His enemy's coming out to get him. He screwed up the infanticide debate. He's having to have the people in the media run out and try to cover for him. And people are, other people are pointing out, wait a second, if Donald Trump did what Ralph Northam did, you people would be throwing him under the bus. You'd be calling him a liar. And now you're defending him? Well, they don't have to defend him any longer. They found their excuse to make him go away. Ralph Northam, you can go to theresurgent.com right now. You can find the link. Uh, Go see that story with the Virginia pilot. I've got the link, front page of the resurgent. You can just click through, find the link to the Virginia pilot and see the picture on his yearbook page. Wow. (laughs) My buddy Dan just texted me and said, wow, I guess the white coat ceremony means something different at Eastern Virginia Medical School. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Oh, my.
my goodness. We'll get back to that here in a minute. Ralph Northam ran for governor of Virginia in 2017. R- Virginia is one of those weird states that has odd-numbered gubernatorial and legislative elections. Louisiana is one. I think Con- is it Kentucky does something like that. Anyway, Virginia is the big one. And how Virginia goes gives you a good indication of how the midterms are going to go. Virginia decisively flipped to the Democrats. Uh, the Republicans are holding on to the state house by one seat. Uh, and Ralph Northam, the governor of Virginia, runs on a ticket. In Georgia, the governor and Democrat run separate from each other. In Virginia, they run as a ticket. They do that in Florida as well. And Ralph Northam's lieutenant governor uh, was Justin Fairfax. Justin Fairfax is black. Justin Fairfax did not appear on mailers run by Ralph Northam in certain parts of the state. Ralph Northam intentionally deleted the picture of his black running mate. And now Ralph Northam is being caught with a picture on his face, on his yearbook page of someone in blackface and someone dressed in a Klan robe and hood. Unreal. We'll see if he lasts by Monday. I'll be back then. Y'all have a good weekend.